electric transportation and its impacts on our power grid. The Electric Power Research Institute, EPRI, is an independent, non-profit company performing research, development and demonstration in the electricity sector for the benefit of the public. EPRI's broad array of collaborative programs focuses on the many specific technology challenges of helping its members provide society with reliable, affordable, and environmentally responsible electricity. Mark Duval is an extremely well-respected specialist in electric transportation and the impacts that it will make on our grid. I've met him at numerous conferences and he was kind enough to speak with me for the book. Craig Shield, Mark, thanks for your help here. I know you've taken a controversial stand on some issues regarding electric transportation. Mark Duval, yes. Right now people say things to get in the press and someone will go out and say, the San Francisco Bay Area needs $1 billion in public infrastructure. And I think I've called that crazy a couple of times. People are pitching this as a chicken and egg problem, and I don't think that it is. C.S., yes, I completely agree with you, for what it's worth. M.D., I think if you look at where infrastructure is going to be the blocking point, it's going to be at home. Early adopters generally live in typical residential situations with parking spaces. So the typical person is going to say to himself, what do I really have to do to incorporate this vehicle into my life? Early adopters are going to take the plunge no matter what, and that's either going to be a positive experience or a negative experience at the home. They're going to tell everybody because that is what influential people do, right? You wouldn't be influential if you didn't tell everybody about your new gadget. So we really need to work very hard to make that initial experience a good one. That really has nothing to do with the city of San Francisco putting in public chargers. That said, I basically told every utility that would listen that they need to consider either putting in or working with one of their cities to put in public charging infrastructure. They need to ask themselves that question, what should we do? Then answer it. If the answer is, we can't do it because our regulators won't let us, or if the answer is to put one out in front of their headquarters, that's fine too. But the point is to do something, be out there, learn from it, and then decide what else to do. Show some leadership. So it's not that I think that we shouldn't do public infrastructure. I just think that we need to look at it on the scale of what is really necessary. We also need to take into account that there are some very large public infrastructure demonstrations being funded by stimulus money. And I think we need to see how those work out, especially with regard to some of the more exotic things like fast charging. So, I am a champion of residential infrastructure. I think I may be the only one, other than the auto companies, who are also aware that this is what has to happen. I believe, there is going to be a natural balance between plug and hybrids, or range extended EVs, as Chevrolet would prefer we call the Volt, and, pure, electric vehicles. I think it's fundamentally not a great idea to try and fit the attributes of a pure electric vehicle to a very much wider set of customer requirements through external infrastructure. So, in other words, build electric vehicles and sell them to the people that can really use them. Support them with an adequate infrastructure, but don't force the issue. Don't try and force one set of vehicle attributes on all drivers. Compact cars in the Prius class is where everyone's fighting it out, and you can do a lot with that category. It's a useful vehicle. Yet, while a 24 kilowatt hours battery would probably make a reasonable EV, you could make a reasonable plug-in hybrid with as little as like a 6 or 7 kilowatt hour battery, 
or you can go to something with a lot more electric capability, like a Volt. But the point is that we are going to need trucks and vans and big cars and we are going to need a lot more vehicles. And that puts a lot of upward pressure on the technology to handle these other applications. The nice thing about a car is that it weighs 3,000 pounds with no one in it and you fill it full of passengers and it weighs, say, 3,700 pounds. That's a little different from a pickup truck that might weigh 5,000 pounds and then you hook up an 11,000 pound trailer. So as you go up and you try and pick up the larger vehicles, which we still buy and drive in very significant quantities, you need to be more clever. You need more plug-in hybrids, you need more adoption of new systems like parallel hybrids, or like GM's dual-mode hybrid which was developed expressly to allow for big trucks and SUVs to do all the things that they do with little to no compromise. So those vehicles can all be made plug-in hybrids. EPRA has vehicle programs that go all the way up to almost 20,000 pounds gross vehicle weight. So you can plug all those vehicles in, you just have to be very strategic about how you do it, and not try and fit all things to all people. I'm very skeptical of somebody trying to make, say, a battery-powered full-sized pickup truck. Yes, I agree. So you see, then, a reasonably long-term trajectory for plug-in hybrids. In other words, you don't see this as here and gone in a few years? MD, no, and the simple matter is that, just remember, plug-in hybrids are more efficient in electric mode than electric vehicles are, since the battery is not as big. At the end of the day, you can create a plug-in hybrid that satisfies a lot of people's needs in a mid-size car with a 6 to 8 kilowatt hours battery. You need a minimum of 24 in a pure electric vehicle. GM is going conservative in the Volt. You'll always have a smaller battery, therefore they are always a little more efficient because they weigh less and we've gotten that sort of turned around recently. I have 15 years of experience working with these plug-in vehicles, and the last couple years was the first time I ever heard anyone say that electric vehicles would be cheaper and more efficient than plug-in hybrids. That's generally not the case. So, to be purely accurate and less controversial, what I would say is that in the use of electricity, Plug-in hybrids are generally at least as efficient as electric vehicles. CS, well, isn't that driven by the fact that right now, the energy density is X and the cost of lithium-ion is dollar $Y per kilowatt hour? In some conceivable future time, the calculus could have completely changed, isn't that true? MD, in order for the calculus to change, more than a couple of things have to happen. Electric powertrains have to be cheaper per kilowatt than gasoline combustion engines. And they're not. So they have to be cheaper for equivalent performance. That's not strictly per kilowatt, but for equivalent performance. In other words, you have to get dramatically cheaper to overcome those cost differences. I think it's safe to say that the theoretical minimum for a lithium-ion battery is going to be about $200 per kilowatt hour. Even futurists should not really expect them to get below that. And that is not in pack form. That's not the added cost. That's not with all the vehicle markups and all that. What you're going to see for the foreseeable future is vehicles are going to come out and they're going to cost a certain amount and if the costs of things like batteries and electric drivetrain components decrease, automakers are going to try to make money. And so that's going to blunt the impact of decreasing battery cost. I hope durability increases to the point where people become more confident that the battery they buy today is going to last the life of the vehicle, 
but at the end of the day I think it's a long way off where an electric vehicle with a full-sized battery is cheaper than a hybrid or a plug-in hybrid. CS, okay, I understand. MD, in the near term, you're going to see all kinds of things. Because they're not going to be based on companies making profit. They're going to be based on near-term business cases designed to get their product out in a smooth fashion with no hiccups or recalls or any technical glitches, and to minimize their per-vehicle loss. That's the near-term. In the long-term, I would find it very difficult for pure electric vehicles, even in the small sedan, to be cheaper than plug-in hybrids. And that will be especially true as you get to larger, more demanding applications. CS, OK. I want to come back to this issue of the business case for the EV OEMs, but as long as we are on the subject of infrastructure, let me just round off that part of this discussion by asking about this. Obviously, if you contemplate ubiquitous fast charging or battery swapping, a better place type of idea, then you've got a different calculus as well. That changes the amount of onboard energy storage that is required for most cars. I say most cars, because if I have a leaf or whatever, I'm not going to take it on long trips, because we're a multi-car family. But if I want to take a car from here to go skiing or something like that, it does require either onboard gasoline or the contemplation of something like fast charging. MD, if you want to drive a pure electric vehicle between cities, you either need a battery exchange or some method of recharging the battery in about the same amount of time it takes to stop for gas. CS, precisely. MD, that is the minimum that consumers will accept. If you think that's a good idea, when's your next long trip coming up? CS, actually, in about two weeks. I'm going from here to Utah. It's a nine-hour drive. MD, what kind of car do you have? CS, an aging BMW 540. MD, okay, well, so to test out my thesis about the driver experience. I want you to start with an empty tank. I want you to go to the gas station when you start your trip and I want you to limit yourself to no more than 2 or 3 gallons of gasoline. And I want you to stop every time you need gas. That's probably overstating it, because with 100 mile range you would start to have range anxiety at about the halfway mark, at a gallon and a half. But limit yourself to 2-3 to three gallons of gas for the whole trip. And then we'll have this call again. CS, well that's my point. The last damn thing I want to do. I'd rather ride my bicycle to Utah than do that. MD, first of all, I am not actually certain that battery swapping is a feasible business case. I know a lot more about fast charging. So the business case to me for all publicly used infrastructure is uncertain to me. I don't think I've really seen numbers that I can really say, yeah, there are people that can run businesses doing this and make money at it. I've seen the Coulomb, EV chargers, business case and I think that's a very telling indication from people who have thought a great deal about this business of how you would manage if you wanted to operate charging networks. You just can't be on the hook for the installation, maintenance, or capital costs. So, they sell the charger and they operate the system on behalf of their customers. Who are the people that buy, install, and maintain the equipment? So, if you had to buy, install, and maintain the equipment, and operate the network yourself, I'm not sure what the business case is for you. I'm not sure how you make money doing that without charging very high prices. I'm writing a big paper about this for one of our utility members, so this is a big discussion. If you want to drive between cities, you need some way of instantly swapping the battery. 
However, people already hate going to the gas station. So it's kind of a stopgap measure at best. Or you put in really big batteries and you do some combination. Like driving a Tesla on your trip wouldn't be as bad because it has roughly 200 miles of range. A guy like you with a BMW 540 is probably not going to get 200 miles, you'll get like 150. So you'll stop every couple of hours and recharge. So that's probably not as bad. That would be really acceptable in Europe where... I have in-laws from friends and they practically pack a picnic lunch for a two-hour drive and they're going to stop halfway. Or you're taking trains, or you're doing other things. But let's stick with the US. You either have 5-minute fast charging or you've got to have a plug-in hybrid. Or you've got to have a conventional car that you rent. You've got to use something else. An electric superhighway concept. People aren't really stopping to use the equipment that much. You would have a hard time making money doing it. You'd have a hard time getting power to some of these installations. Those gas stations that are out on the off-ramp, they are feeding off of a long circuit. It's miles from a substation. So... The utility may be looking at a whole line upgrade just to get you the 500 kilowatts you'd need to run a station like that. But let's assume that's not an issue. The point is that you're driving, you're pulling over every hour to recharge your car. Or you move these technologies into the city and you use them in two ways. For people who want to drive an electric vehicle and it is 90% of their daily driving but they are afraid to get caught without a charger, they're afraid their kids will get sick and they'll have to run home before they'll get a chance to fully recharge, or some unforeseeable but rare circumstance. So then, the fast charging network or the battery swapping network has a role to play. It also could have a role to play for people who don't drive a lot, but who don't have a parking space. So if you don't have a parking space you could go and get your car refilled at these battery swapping places or a fast charging place where you just pull in for 5 minutes. But I want to point out that the 2 to 3 gallon rule applies. People that have to do that every day aren't likely to be happy with it. People who live in the city and don't drive their car to work or don't drive very many miles could be relatively happy with that idea. Or they could just buy a plug-in hybrid. Either way, the point is that the cost of that infrastructure would greatly exceed its benefits if it were not done correctly. I haven't seen the numbers, but my preliminary back-of-the-envelope calculations show that these are very tough business cases especially with a network, because by definition a network has to account for the fringe. Regarding fast charging, Tokyo has a nice demo. They had a charger in the basement of their parking garage in their Tokyo headquarters. And they had some electric vehicles for their employees to drive that they could all fast charge. And when I mean fast charge, 50 kilowatts. This is not interstate fast charge. This is 5 minutes that will get you the rest of the way home or a half hour will get you pretty close to a full recharge. So this is not, I would say, super fast charge. And before that, when they just had one fast charger, people drove very limited routes and always came back with more than half the battery capacity remaining because they were worried about getting caught. But when they put a fast charger on the other end of town, people drove everywhere, and tended to come back with much less than half the battery remaining. So the point is that putting that charger out there created a simple network, and caused people to drive a lot more and with a lot more confidence. But they never used that charger. So if you're the guy that owns that charger and paid $30 minus $40,000 for it, and $20,000 to put it in the ground and wire up electricity to it, and has to pay the peak demand charges to operate it sometimes, 
you're sitting pretty unhappy. In the meantime, cities, communities in general, should focus on creating practical public charging networks that serve the vehicles that are in their community today, meaning, you get ready for a rollout and you have a comprehensive plan, but you build to suit. So, for the Bay Area of California, step one is refurbishing the existing infrastructure. Put new charge stations in on top of the existing wires so you have the modern connector which probably won't even be available for another two or three months, and get ready. There are thousands of stations out there. The other thing is that, I think that there are decisions to be made as to what people buy. So if you have a choice between a vehicle like the Chevy Volt or a pure electric vehicle, you really should take a look at your lifestyle and not depend on a public infrastructure to get you through the day. One of my closest friends is a guy named Dan Santini who is an economist for Argonne National Labs and he's been doing these studies with EPRI from the beginning. He would look at this and he would say we need to do plug-in hybrids with the smallest possible battery because that gives you the greatest benefit per kilowatt hour of battery or per extra vehicle cost. Obviously it's a combination of economics and driver demand and what makes people feel good about themselves. Chevrolet certainly didn't intend for the Volt to be the most cost-effective plug-in hybrid. They intended for it to be a vehicle that would meet most of their customers' needs, leverage powerful technology that they had already developed in-house. It's basically an electric vehicle for the first 40 miles of the day yet it can do everything you need. Nissan has got their approach. Who knows, five years from now, Nissan could also be making a plug-in hybrid and GM could be making an electric vehicle. We don't really know where this is going to go. There are enough early adopters to buy all these things. I don't think demand is going to be an issue. Supply is going to be issue. CS, right. Well that's exactly what I believe. Let me ask you this. The theme of who killed the electric car? Is that there is no real sincerity on the part of the OEMs to do this regardless of what they say. If they're doing this at all it's because they have to. MD, well, I can neither confirm nor deny the sincerity of the OEMs. Personally. I believe the EV1 was a very sincere effort at GM, and that they would have never gone to those lengths if they had not been sincere about putting it into production. Was it successful? No. Did they handle the endgame of that program as well as they could have? Well, even they would not try and argue that. But you would never design a car from the ground up and engineer almost every part if you weren't trying to change a game somewhere. This technology disruption looks different in the automotive industry than elsewhere. This is why I think we haven't seen a lot of success of classic technology disruption models working in the auto industry. Toyota put a great deal of effort behind the Prius pushing it into production and selling 2 million cars. My hat's off to them. They changed the industry and they did it because I think they felt it would ultimately be in their long-term benefit. What I'm seeing in the auto industry is companies that have lost faith in the future of stable gasoline prices. They believe very firmly that high gasoline prices, which they're certain to see once the economy picks up, will be drastically limiting to developing countries' automotive markets. So China and India aren't the gold mine that they need them to be unless they have a cheap energy source. On the other hand, a cheap energy source is electricity. In the United States, we do have some regulation setting kind of a floor. I mean, we have the zero emission vehicle mandate. I can't remember if it's in 11 or 12 states now, and it sets kind of a floor that's in the neighborhood of tens of thousands of vehicles in the near term. But the scale that the auto companies need to make money is far greater than that. 
For what it's worth, I don't think we can determine, given all the management changes at GM, and earlier at Ford, what's really in the minds of the top executives. But I think we can say that the Volt, and I assume the Leaf, are going through a full automotive production development cycle. Those cars are being developed like they would develop their Buick. If you were to tell me that they have no idea how this will all turn out, I could agree with that. I think they may have quite a bit of uncertainty as to how this is going to turn out. But I know how it's going to turn out. I mean, this is going to be the biggest thing since sliced bread and the only limiting factor will be can the costs come down to the point where it's profitable for the automakers. I'm not saying it's going to be their biggest profit. I don't think Prius is Toyota's biggest profit. CS, no. MD, at some point, the externalities are going to bear down on the auto industry and they're going to need to do something. I mean, the growth charts are probably a lot different for the United States than they were back in 2005, you know around 2003. 2004, 2005, the U.S. was slated to use 60% more gasoline for the light-duty fleet in 2030 than in 2003. It's probably less than that now, but the point is that our population is still growing, we are driving more, every country whose affluence is growing is going to be driving more, and we are going to have to find real alternatives. We can do some biofuels. That's a big advantage of being the United States, being the world's number one agricultural producer, and we have a lot of land relative to our population. It will get us part way there, but it will not get us to some sustainable future. And those realities cannot be ignored by the auto industry anymore. So they are going to have to do something substantive. I think they've felt that for a long time. C.S. By the way, let me ask you about hydrogen. People tend to think 1. That it's a red herring, as suggested in Who Killed the Electric Car? That is, the OEMs love this because they know it will never happen, or 2. They believe Honda who says this is a legitimate contender for dealing with the range issue. M.D. I started off primarily a car guy doing automotive research at UC Davis and other places, and now that I'm at EPRA I've gradually become a little more of a utility person. The issue with that is that hydrogen has a huge infrastructure problem. That infrastructure problem does not go away. It's much greater than for electric vehicles. So the way for hydrogen to be successful is if the vehicles could be made at very low cost, to justify the high cost of the infrastructure. That's not likely to be happening in the near future. CS, no, in fact, the precise opposite seems to be the case. MD, then once you get there, I think the issue also is that hydrogen requires a lot more energy than electricity per mile. So the simplest infrastructure would be sort of on-site electrolysis. That's going to use like four times the electricity per mile. So it uses four times the electricity per mile. You have really large equipment costs at the point. And you lose a lot of energy. So unless we are just generating enormous quantities of near-zero carbon energy, you lose a lot of the benefit. CS, right. MD, at the end of the day the problem with hydrogen is you need a near zero emitting source. You still have to compress it. That compression uses a significant amount of electricity by itself. It's just very tough. It uses a lot of energy. There are definitely niche applications in transit and heavy duty and other things that you can use it for, but would those be enough to really sustain an industry and get your economies of scale? I don't know. I feel for hydrogen because I've been there. I was in the boat when they tossed electric vehicles overboard. 
so I know what it feels like when the technological focus and the policy focus shifts from one technology to the other. In this world, a new automotive technology has about, I want to say, a seven-year window. It could be five years, it could be eight or nine, but you have like seven years to make something happen. Take hybrids. We're five years into this. They were getting to the point where they had to make something happen when we finally got the new Prius and the Ford Escape and the Highlander and the newer Honda hybrids. I mean they were five years into their window when we finally got cars that the average American wanted to drive. And then Toyota pushed this thing. Toyota with big contributions from Honda and Ford and you have the others doing their part as well. Being interested pushed hybrids into sustainable business where, granted probably not everybody is making money on it, but it's certainly on track and it's going forward. We'll see more hybrids and that's fantastic. So the issue is, you've got this seven-year window. Electric vehicles had it. Hydrogen has it. Plug-in hybrids and electric vehicles for a second time have it. And I think that day one was probably January of 2007, maybe mid-year. They announced the Volt, but it was mid-year before people started believing it was real and other car companies started piling on with their programs. So maybe we've got until, Obama's million vehicles by 2015 is probably somewhat accidental, but it really would signal planting the flag for these technologies. You get to those million vehicles by 2015 and you've probably got a sustainable plug-in vehicle industry moving forward. So that's our goal. So are we going to get vehicles on the market? Yes. Are they going to be successful? That's what we have to do to make them successful. See, so yes, I've never been able to get excited about hybrids. All the kinetic energy to the rear wheels comes from gasoline, you just have a black box in a hybrid that does something that happens to do with electricity. If you don't have a plug, all you're doing is changing the way you burn gasoline. Why didn't Toyota do this in 2004 or 2005? MD, in 2004, no one was talking about this except EPRI and some utilities. There was one OEM program working with Daimler Chrysler on a plug-in hybrid sprinter van. I mean there was nothing. CS, yes, but I'm amazed that EVs had completely fallen off everyone's radar screen. In the late 1990s we had the EV1 and the Toyota RAV4. The concept of an electric vehicle wasn't foreign to anybody. And everyone knew that represented the capability to move us away from oil. Everybody recognized that there is an issue with emissions, whether you're worried about global warming or whether you're worried about lung disease. So my point is, that this isn't new news. The automotive industry could have done this earlier. Why didn't they? MD, yes they could. But they didn't. Toyota could have. I built many plug-in hybrid vehicle prototypes with nickel metal hydride batteries, but I think the production folks sincerely felt that it was a steep enough challenge just to do a hybrid. I think that was the issue. CS, yes, okay. Well that's cool. MD, yes, I mean, we could play hindsight all you want. What if GM had kept making 1000 EV1s a year just to study how they work, kept incrementally advancing the technology? Auto companies don't seem to do that, at least not in public. They tend to go after something like they are going to do it now and then if it doesn't work they move on and they do something else. So whenever people ask me what EPRI's role has been, or who was responsible for all this, I would say did you see Davis show the world that you could build a plug-in hybrid that would do everything a normal car did with high-performance electric drive components? Yes, I think they did. 
And what did EPRA and the utilities do? Did we invent it? No. We incubated it. So, we kept the concept alive and moving forward and showed that it was not only technically possible but of societal value. We showed that it could be done and we kept it moving in that time between 2000 and 2007 when there was literally nothing going on. And so now that these things are emerging, we are trying to figure out the best way to plug them into the grid. And I like where we are, because we can just plug them into the grid. That has always worked with new electrical appliances and it will work here too. CS Yes, exactly, unplug your toaster and plug in your car. I like it. What about smart grid technologies? MD, we can plug these into the existing grid. Utilities will serve the load. It's the way it's always been. It's always worked. The industry's always figured out how to make that work. If we can fully integrate them into the smart grid and utilities can work with their customers, who are the vehicle owners, to charge at the most beneficial time of the day for the person and for the system, we can maximize the benefits that the vehicles bring and minimize the impacts. Now, ratepayers in general have to pay for a lot of the impacts, so we want to keep the impacts low and the benefits high. And a lot of that has to do with simple messages communicated back and forth between vehicles and the grid that convey owner preferences and requirements and system costs and the system conditions. So if you want to charge with the lowest cost electricity, the best way to do that is to feed the vehicle a 24-hour cost curve for electricity when it's plugged in and have it cross-reference that against its owner's preferences and figure out when it's best to charge. And repeating this with tens of millions of vehicles will require very simple, very effective interfaces between the cars and the grid. That means every vehicle has got to come out of the box ready to talk to anything it finds on the other side of the grid. Which is, hopefully, directly to utility smart meters or to home networks, the devices that people will be using in increasing numbers to manage their own energy consumption. Every vehicle has got to be capable of doing that. It's got to have small low-cost communication technology on board to be able to do that and be a living breathing part of the smart grid. CS, what about V2G, vehicle to grid? MD, I see a lot of different possibilities for vehicle to grid. I think it goes without saying that people will want to charge their car at different times of the day and that the smart folks who run the grid will figure out how to use that storage, incentivize people to be able to use that storage. So if you're at a utility that has a lot of wind power, that wind power tends to be really high at night and you'll figure out how to convince some of your drivers to charge late at night and provide a source for that power, a load for that power to go to. CS, will this be more about backup power? Waveform stabilization, or both? MD, will cars be able to provide backup power to homes and buildings? Well there is some evidence that with hybrids, people have already rigged hybrids to do this in emergencies. There are a couple people that have weathered snowstorm outages with a giant inverter wire to the 12V battery of their Prius. So the high voltage battery would feed this 12V inverter and when the high voltage battery got low, the engine would come on for a few minutes, charge everything back up, turn off again, rinse and repeat for 3 days. So can they provide backup power? Yes. Can they interact with a premise to help peak shave and energy demand? I think so. Will there be regulation services and peak shaving and spending reserves into the grid? I think that's to be determined. I think we need better business cases and we need to know more about how these would work and we need to know more about the overlap of other new technologies. For example, 
If utilities go after bulk storage to do things like aggregate when resources were to help with ramping or integration of renewables or other system demands, those things will ultimately end up competing with vehicles in the VG space. Because I always define vehicle to grid as providing contractual services to the system operator. So that's voltage and frequency regulation, up, down, spinning reserves, things like that. I think we need to understand those business cases a lot better, the costs to the vehicle, the costs the operators incur, how that will compete with a big stationary battery or a compressed air energy storage plant or a pumped hydro plant. We need to learn a lot more about these things and how the grid is designed for power to flow to the source. CS, thanks so much, Mark. This has been great. For more information on this contributor, please visit http colon slash slash to greenenergy.com slash renewable dash energy dash facts dash fantasies slash dot